All right. Welcome to One Week Critiques, Critique of the Week. This week, we are interviewing Billy Tedros. Thank you for being here, Billy. Thanks so much for having me, Matthew. Uh, could you just start off by telling us a little bit about yourself? Who are you? Sure. Um, so I'll start with my professional bio. Um, so I'm an assistant professor in the Department of English and Theater at the University of Scranton. Um, so I teach courses in writing and literature, so including poetry, um, courses in the health humanities and in women and gender studies. Um, and so all of this is in Scranton, Pennsylvania, which is in fact a real place. Um, so I'm told that there was this kind of Twitter storm in April and May. People thought it was only real on the office. It is in fact a real place. Um, so I live in Scranton uh, with my wife and our two dogs. Um, other things about me, um, I'm an ex runner, um, which has recently become really important to my writing work as well. Um, and in the absence of that, I have taken up teaching these pound fitness classes, um, which are these high intensity, low impact cardio workouts that involve drumsticks. Um, and I bring this up because I have been known to bring these sticks into the poetry classroom and demonstrate poetic meter. Um, and then uh, as a poet, um, I've got a few chapbooks and two books of poems. Um, so the first is The Tree We Planted and Buried You In, uh, which was published by Otis Books in 2018. Um, and then more recently, just this June, Was Body, which is out from Indolent Books. Um, and right now, uh, despite the pandemic schedule, um, <laughs> Goldwake Press is scheduled to publish my third book, uh, Graph Fixation, in early 2021. Great. I wish I had someone with drumsticks that could have taught me meter. I think that was one of the hardest things for me to learn. I'll have uh, to invite you to one of my Zoom classes then. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be great. I need to get some drumsticks or, or are you the only one using the drumsticks? Um, I can put you in touch with some websites online where you can get your own pair, Matthew. All right, all right. thank you. All right, so today we're gonna talk about a poem that initially had a title and then was published with a second title. Um, so let me bring these up here. Um, the first one, is November Not Sonnet on a Boat by the Dock Bar. Uh, could you read this earliest form of the poem? Sure. November Not Sonnet on a Boat by the Dock Bar. You are someone with a penchant for dark, beers and pasts, walk-in closets and porch step, smokes, who likes to ride it out to the depths of the middle of Lake Hapatkong spark, flint of cigarette lighter and long drags of conversation about coffee, sex, identity construction and your next lover, dive from the stern, put out the fag in the water, peel off sopping cotton on the deck and move to ceaseless carnal, moon waves rocking, unanchored in the fall, when it's too cold to be this naked in the cold, it's too cold to be this in love. All right, thank you. And so this poem originated roughly 2010. Um, so, and it was published uh, recently in 2020, January, I believe. Right. Uh, so from inception to publication, right? That's 10 years, a whole decade. You know, in what ways uh, did you think about or edit this piece during that time? Yeah, um, so let me go back to kind of the origin story for the poem. Um, so at the time, so again, it, it originated in 2010, 2011, somewhere in there. Um, I was working on my MFA at Sarah Lawrence in New York. Um, I'm pretty sure I never brought this poem into a workshop, um, but it was part of a series of poems I was working on at the time um, that I was calling the series of dive bar sonnets. It was very sophisticated, as you might imagine. Um, <laughs> And I, I was using it as this way to kind of play with the sonnet form, um, but also it was this way to kind of work out this series of breakups uh, with ex-girlfriends by reflecting on these dive bars that I haunted um, to recover from these breakups in some maybe ill-adjusted ways involving beers and buttery nipples. Um, but anyway, so this, this poem was part of that series. Um, so the draft title, November Not Sonnet on a Boat by the Dock Bar. Um, references a dock bar that 
never existed, at least in, in my own life. Um, so I made it up. So in that sense, this poem was already kind of an outlier in this series that otherwise um, had titles that actually did pay homage <laughs> um, to actual dive bars. Um, okay, so that's a little bit of backstory. And around this time, um, so I was in Tina Chang's workshop. And like I said, we didn't discuss this poem, at least as far as I remember, I may have repressed it. Um, but I do remember in one of my first meetings with her, she said, and I, I don't remember exactly how she said it, but she expressed that um, it seemed like maybe I was putting up some emotional walls in my poems. Um, and I remember being very surprised by this because I thought, well, here I am writing this very personal content that I'm trying to sublimate onto the page, right? How could I have these walls up? Um, but in some ways, I think I was definitely using form. So both received forms like the sonnet and these really restricted rules of, of nonce forms um, to kind of hide behind mechanics in a way. Um, so I know one poem I brought in around this time um, was another heartbreak poem. There was a theme in 2010, 2011, uh, but it had 10 sections. And so like, the first section was 10 lines of 10 syllables each. And the next section was nine lines of nine syllables each. And it went on like that, right? Um, but anyway, so I, I was so fixated on mechanics, but to the exclusion of the elements of form that I think can make a poem move and, and in that effect, make it moving. Um, and that's not to say that strict formal rules are at odds um, with emotion because they're not, of course. Um, but this was something I kind of had to work through when I revisited um, the poem. And I, I really didn't revisit it until about 10 years later. So a long time had passed in between. Um, but anyway, so, so maybe that's also part of why the sonnet becomes a not sonnet in this case, right? I, I think in some ways the draft kind of exhausted itself by the 13th line. So if you see it's 13 lines, not 14. Um, and just as a clarification, because I read a great series of, of not sonnets or near sonnets recently, that's not to say that all near sonnets or not sonnets exhaust themselves. Um, Kimberly Ann Southwick actually this month has a chapbook of poems out with uh, Ghost City Press that you can download from their website. Um, that's all near sonnets, as she calls them. And they're, they're 10 line sonnets that adopt um, the octave of the Italian sonnet and then close basically with the couplet of the English sonnet. Um, but anyway, I digress. So when I returned to the poem, I decided to ditch the bar for starters since it never existed in the first place. So you can still see the remnant of that in the dark beers and past line. Um, but it became less about um, the dive bar and more about, um, I, I guess, this emotional content, which is both the speaker's identification of herself and, and this lost relationship, right? Um, than about that specific part of the place. Um, and so I decided to actually adhere to the sonnet form more strictly. Um, so both versions do have decasyllabic lines. Um, neither one of them uses iambic pentameter, although I could pound that out for you. Um, <laughs> Um, but so, and in that way, ironically, I think the constraint actually forced me um, to really confront the speaker's emotionality more and not hide behind the mechanics in some ways. Um, and so I was looking back at the, the old draft and um, one of the things that's interesting in the revision is what stayed the same um, as well as what ended up changing. Um, so looking back at this, um, like the, the line endings of the first nine lines are the same, um, even though internally many of those lines did change and sometimes in, in subtle ways. So like line three I was looking at, um, who likes to write it out to the depths becomes who liked to write it out to the depths. Um, and so in the revision of the new title, uh, we were women, we were already receding. There's already the suggestion of this past tense of this relationship before you even enter the poem, right? Um, but what is in line three now with that liked instead of likes kind of makes that more evident from the beginning. Um, and another thing I was looking at and, and reflecting on this revision was, was what is the last line of the first draft, um, which I think is actually pretty flat. The cold, it's too cold to be this in love. Um, now, contrastingly, the last four lines of the revision, they offer the same literal information, right? Like, hey, it's cold in the fall on Lake Kapatkong. Um, but the speaker's recollection of that in the last line in the new version suggests um, that the end of this love affair was kind of in the forecast, just like the weather, um, if you will, right? She says, I remember, you'd kiss me and shiver. Um, so there are definitely a lot of things that you can see that, that remained from draft 2010, 2011 um, to revision 2020. But in some ways, I think I was thinking about how do I more strictly adhere to this, these formal constraints that I adopted, but at the same time allow more freedom 
um, for the speaker to move beyond being mechanical about what it is she's saying. Definitely, yeah. That idea of freedom plays into my next question, right? Like the early version is all one stanza, right? And the uh, published version or later version that I have up on the screen here has a lot more white space. And uh, you sent me a couple of different uh, poems with multiple drafts. And I noticed that some of the early poems or drafts, right, have not as much white space. And then a lot of your work recently, um, including in Was Body, utilizes that white space quite a bit. So what um, is your process for reformatting poems or how has the initial writing experience changed over the years for you? Yeah, so the, the white space thing is something I thought a lot about too. And I'm, I'm smirking because uh, as a teacher, this is something I've been um, recommending to students. Okay, well, why do you play with the breaks? Why do you play with space? Um, and I'm smirking because this revision also evidences um, something else <laughs> I took as advice from an editor that I've now been um, bringing into the classroom ad nauseum. Um, so just to go off slight digression for a second, my, my next book in its first draft had all titles that were no longer than, than two words. Um, so all of the titles were two words or fewer. And uh, <laughs> my editor at Goldway, uh, Kyle McCord, he gave me this challenge. He said, okay, I want you in this next revision to try not to have a single title in this manuscript that has fewer than three words. Um, and it was one of the greatest challenges I had faced <laughs> up to that point as a poet. And so now from that period, you get, we were women, we were already receding, right? Um, and so anyway, I bring this, this into the classroom, but also this conversation about space. So I think I, as a younger poet, I used to think that intensity um, had a directly proportional relationship to density, and not just in terms of a, a compression of utterance, but also of space on the page, right? Um, and I'm appreciating more and more, I think, um, as I mature as a poet, not always as a person, but as a poet, um, that there are benefits to taking a beat, um, taking a breath, taking a break, right? Um, I, I think a lot these days about arthritis, <laughs> um, thinking about this ex-runner thing. Um, and recently I compared my poetics to, to writing within um, the decaying or narrowing joint space. So maybe the, the, the converse of that is thinking about, you know, how do I try to put some space back in there? Um, and, and less obliquely, I can say this, again, thinking about my work as, as an editor and as a teacher, um, and in that sense, being this, this active reader and kind of advocate for other people's work as well, um, I, I think a lot about what a line break does, and even more than that, um, what a stanza break can do, right? So in the revision of this poem, I think I was really interested in the ambiguity that more space might allow for. Um, so even though a lot of the line breaks, like we talked about, actually remain the same through more than the first half of the poem, um, now there are these couplets. And I have this new obsession with couplets, too. Some of that's visual. Um, but a lot of it is also, if I, if I break not only a line, but also a stanza, I'm asking the reader to consider this stanza as a unit that exists by itself but that also participates in, in the structure of how the poem is moving down the page, right? Um, so it has at least these two roles in that way. Um, and thinking again back about the, just kind of the progression that in some ways this revision represents of my work as a poet. Um, as a younger poet, I would describe myself as having been pretty inflexible. Um, so not only in my poetics, but also in, in just my, my worldview, I guess. It was difficult for me to um, conceive of other possibilities once I had settled on a single perception, right? Um, and now I think my writing at its best invites those possibilities. Like now in this next decade of my life, I'm understanding, oh, multiple things can be conflicting and true at the same time. Um, and what an interesting that is thing that is to kind of put on the page. So like this speaker, for example, um, she may be criticizing the careless kind of recklessness even um, of this once beloved, but she's also admiring it, right? She's also longing for it at the same time. So along with poems in Was Body, which came out this year in June, 2020, um, as you said, published by Indolent Books, uh, this poem uses diction and repetition in transformative ways. Um, I'm thinking of in the new uh, draft of this particular poem, uh, 
the lines, it's too cold in the fall on the water, we fall in, too naked for falling in, naked and docking, unanchored like this. And then also some of the poems from uh, the book that are theme and variation poems, right? And I think the sounds and variants carry through uh, the lines in stanzas within these poems. How do you cultivate poetic skills such as these and implement them in the drafting and editing process? Yeah, um, so I think it's not insignificant to mention here um, that I, I majored in music when I was in college. So I majored in creative writing, but I also majored in music. Um, and fun, small world fact for a second. Um, I watched Adam's one week critique um, interview with Monica Prince last week. Um, and so the place where I majored in music and creative writing is where Prince now teaches. So at Susquehanna University, so just <laughs> small world, <laughs> six yeah. degrees of separation. Um, but anyway, all of that's to say that, I, and I was studying music composition at the time. Um, and I think I kind of started to cultivate this, this predilection or this habit um, for pattern and specifically for sonic repetition um, in some ways moving from that pursuit and that study, right? And thinking about things like motif. Um, I think it's also fair to say that there's probably a hint of obsession um, in this poetic process too. That's probably one of the things that also drew me to distance running. Um, We'll just let that sit. Um, but it's, it's this accumulation of repetitions that, that gradually together constitutes something new, right? Um, it constitutes this kind of arrival. Um, and I think in many of the poems, the one we're talking about and also some of the ones that just came out in Was Body, um, the speakers are trying to work through something, right? Sometimes they're trying to remember something or they're trying to figure something out. Um, and often I think they do that with these repetitions um, that are characterized by these kind of slow sonic transpositions um, that at their best, I think, eventually arrive somewhere else at some other kind of realization or some other kind of place. Yeah, I, I think it's really interesting, especially reading the theme and variation poems where you start with, right, an idea of diction of some sort, and then we move through the poem. And I'm like, oh yeah, I've never paired this particular word or phrase with this other particular word or phrase. And that's where we get the transformation throughout the different sections of a poem. So I love that. Um, you're also affiliated faculty, as you said, in the Women's and Gender Studies program at the University of Scranton. Um, and your poems engage with gender and sexuality in a myriad of ways. How do you use your knowledge of women's and gender studies to inform your poetry? And what advice would you offer poets hoping to do the same? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. It's something I had to think about, um, even in, in answering the questions for the about this poem um, that appears at the Academy of American Poets um, poem a day, which is where um, we were women, we were already receding appeared. Um, but one of the things I talk at length about with students, um, both in poetry classes and in the lit classes that are part of our um, women's and gender studies program is that language is incredibly sloppy, um, that it's always an approximation. Um, so just to give an example that's, that's relevant to both of these kind of aspects of my practice, um, I call myself a queer woman because that's the language I have that most closely approximates my experience of myself um, in and as a body moving through the world, right? Um, and similarly, I think the speaker in this poem offers um, just even the first 10 lines, this kind of one breathless sentence that's this attempt to describe who the you is uh, to the speaker, right? Um, so you are someone with a penchant for dark fears and pasts, and she goes on for 10 lines. And, and I think in some ways, maybe she keeps going into more and more detail, um, because the more detail she provides, the, the closer the approximation, um, her description will be to who this actual person is that she can't touch, but she also can't touch in words, right? Not really. Um, and one of the things I bring up in these classes, um, one of my favorite essays, uh, is by Alicia Ostreicher, and it's called, uh, Metaphor and Healing or why metaphor is not a bandage. Um, and I do almost have the quote I'm gonna give you memorized, but because I find any excuse to bring this up, I did pull it up so I can quote it for you in full. Um, but she offers this gorgeous definition of metaphor. Um, and I return to it all the time to explain this kind of approximation, right? This, this sloppiness of language. Um, so here's what it is and I'll quote this in full. So she says, uh, the pleasure we take in metaphor is a pleasure of consent. 
an agreement that the distance between two things is cancelable because of their likeness, whereby each illuminates some inner truth belonging to the other. Um, and arguably, I think all language is metaphorical in that way, um, including, if not especially, the language we use to talk about gender and sexuality, at least in English. Um, you know, we seek language that gets as close as we can possibly get to this truth that we're trying to represent, um, or this, this experience that we're trying to represent, but really all the while knowing that it's inevitably going to fail. Um, it's only ever going to be an approximation. Um, but also knowing at the same time that that approximation is going to teach us more about the language that we're using to try to represent it and the experience we're trying to represent at its best, right? Um, and so to the other part of your, your question, um, if I'm remembering, I, I go off and I ramble, I apologize, but um, for other poets who are interested in kind of um, representing this, this kind of content or these kinds of theoretical ideas, um, I think for starters, you have to be ready for failure because it's inevitable, right? <laughs> um, and also I think to begin by seeking the language to articulate your own positionality. Um, so I, I'm still in some ways trying to work to figure out what is, what is my position in this conversation? Um, like, what do I have to contribute to these larger theoretical conversations about um, gender and sexuality? And, and I often start by trying to figure out, okay, well, how will I approximate in language who I am in this conversation, for starters? And let me move from there. Um, and so one joke I've been making a lot lately, um, as my website has been getting a little bit more traffic than it did previously with the book, um, is that on my website, my bio has said, and has said for the last few years, <laughs> um, that I am seeking to articulate a feminist injury poetics. Um, and uh, the seeking there is really important, but I'll come back to that. But another writer recently asked me, well, why do you use the word feminist? Why is it a feminist injury poetics as opposed to, for example, a queer injury poetics? Um, and so I took some time to think about that. And I'm still thinking on it. So I'm still seeking to articulate it. I'm not articulating it yet. Um, but one of the things I told her is that in some ways, I think I look to the word feminist and I cleave to it in some ways because it's, it's the first language I was given um, to approximate equality among genders, right? So in some ways, it's this familiar part of my lexicon. Um, and the other part of it that I think in some ways is more interesting for me to theoretically parse is that sonically, um, you know, it echoes femme and it echoes feminine and it forces me to be very critically conscious um, of the ways that I have tried to divorce myself from the feminine and I don't want to let myself off easy there And this is a personal thing. I think I need to confront what the source of that is right and and what it is What it is I might be arguing or representing if I just take that kind of um, Refusal of the feminine as a given because I, I don't think it's a given so all of that is to say maybe my other advice um, Is to keep pushing yourself to explain um, maybe more articulately than I just did um, why you use the language you do, um, like what's informing that lexicon? Well, I think that was an excellent answer. And maybe you're still seeking, but you're, you're doing a great job in my, in my opinion. Um, yeah, I was actually, I'm, I'm started reading this uh, essay uh, to start this book called The World Split Open. Um, I forget the woman's first name, but her last name is Bernacow. And she was talking a little bit about uh, the shame and ugliness of using the word poetess to mm. feel, to, to refer to a female poet, right? And it's a really great essay. I'm not done with it, but I'm totally going to send it to you at some point because I think it's great. Um, if you haven't already read it. No, please send that my way. Okay. Um, so back to the poem. Um, this, as you said, was uh, published in the Academy of, of American Poets Poem a Day series. Uh, would you read us the published version of the poem? Sure. We were women, we were already receiving. You are someone with a penchant for dark, fears and pasts, walk-in closets and porch step, smokes who liked to ride it out to the depths of the middle of Lake Hapatkong spark, the flint of your lighter take longing drags and talk about hipster coffee and sex with whipped cream designs. And sometimes you're next, lover, and dive in to put out the fag, swim to the deck to peel off your cotton boxers and wring them in your fighter's fist. It's too cold in the fall on the water. We fall in too naked for falling in, naked and docking unanchored like this. I remember 
you'd kiss me and shiver. Yeah, that poem does produce a shiver, especially with those lines I love right at the end. It's too cold in the fall in the water to the end. It really, you've really done a great job, I think, of taking that idea and feeling of the first draft and like turning it into something very, very special. Um, I also have the privilege of working with you on Fairy Tale Review uh, as an associate poetry editor. Um, could you talk about what you look for in poems that are submitted for publication? And how do you think this aligns or diverges from your personal work? Sure. Um, and so we talked about line breaks a little bit before. Um, and Matthew, since we've been in these conversations together, this probably won't surprise you. Um, one of the things that I value most and look for are probably really skillful line breaks. So that means a couple of things. One, well-crafted lines that clearly exist as independent units um, within a poem, but that also do structural work to move the poem forward. Um, and I'm definitely a sucker for line breaks that create ambiguities or subvert my expectations. Um, and I'll talk about prose poems in a minute because that complicates this. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> but one of the things I say in classrooms um, again, if, if you're writing a lineated poem, and we'll talk about the prose poem in a second, but if you're writing a poem with line breaks, that formal element is one of the things that distinguishes this genre from anything else you could be writing. Um, so make it, there should be a reason why something is a line, right? Why that exists by itself. Okay, so prose poems. <laughs> um, if I'm not looking for line breaks, I look for texts that own that liminal space that exists between um, what we would traditionally call a poem, right? And what we would traditionally call prose. Um, so texts, I guess that you could say that, that queer those boundaries, those categories, um, and my expectations for what poems and prose not only should look like, um, but what they should do or say, right? Um, and I think in the prose poem, it's often um, an ability to evoke narrative because for me, seeing that block on the page evokes narrative, even if what it's doing is not telling a story, right? Um, but maybe is doing something else. Um, and, and in all cases, I think I really appreciate a, a materiality about language, so language that's really embodied. Um, so in terms of how this diverges from or, or kind of syncs with my work, I think when I'm working at my best, those are definitely some of the same things I'm striving to create, the same things I'm looking for as an editor. Um, interestingly, one of the things that I have a bias is probably the wrong word, but a bias against in my own production um, is that I've tended to move farther and farther away from narrative. Um, I'm not sure why that is, and it just may be a thing about what I'm doing right now. Um, but contrastingly, um, if we're looking at work that deals with the fairy tale, obviously, um, there's a lot of work that's playing with narrative, right? Or that's telling stories. Oh, yeah. um, so in that sense, it very much diverges, I guess, from, from a lot of what I've been doing lately. So I know you love line breaks. If you could give writers one tip regarding the revision process, and maybe I'm gonna try and make you take out the line breaks. <laughs> <laughs> what would the tip be uh, for those poets revising a poem? Um, so I've been thinking about this because I've watched your other one week critique uh, interview, so I knew this was probably coming in some form. Um, the easy answer I didn't plan to give, uh, but I will now is see if you can make that title at least three words. I want titles <laughs> at least three words. Um, no, but I guess there are two primary tips I would offer. The second one I think is always applicable and the first one usually is. Um, so the first one would be um, to read the text from the body. And in the past I would have said, read this aloud, um, which is for me what it usually is. Um, but uh, before the pandemic, <laughs> if we can even remember that time back in February, um, I had the pleasure of bringing Meg Day um, as a guest reader and speaker to my classes. Um, and one of the things they talked with the students a lot about was um, the ways in which we privilege um, hearing and sound um, in what we expect from poems, both as, as writers and as readers, right? So I've been trying to cut against this um, in my own conceptions of work. And I think you can absolutely embody a poem without hearing it, right? Um, for me, I do often read it aloud, and some of that is about hearing it, but some of it's also about mouthing it, right? Like the feeling the language and feeling where the line ends. Um, and so I, I think there's something to be said about in revision, experimenting with how a poem moves and how it moves through spaces in bodily ways, right? Um, effectively kind of performing, if we're using line breaks, the line breaks, but, but even if there aren't line breaks, just how it moves through the space, right? Um, and I guess the second tip, which I think is always applicable, um, is that I think that if you're going back through your draft, every single word, every single line, every single break, 
every single mark of punctuation um, should be doing its work. And you should be able to articulate, um, to understand and articulate what that work is. And that's certainly not to say that all readers are going to interpret what those elements of form are doing in the same way that you do as a writer. Um, but I think we need to have a rationale um, for all of our poetic choices. And, and that's even if that rationale is that, hey, right now I'm following a chance-based procedure um, and I'm honoring what that chance-based process generated. Um, and that's something that I have introduced even in the revision process, you know, taking something that began from some other um, formal generative process and saying, okay, let me see what happens if I, you know, adopt N plus seven here or something like that, if I do something chance-based. But I think, I think we should be able as writers to, to understand and articulate what is it that I would say um, every piece of this is doing. Yeah, no, I think that's great. I find myself, uh, you know, aggravated over an article that I want to either keep or take out. You know, something as simple as that where I'm like, but that doesn't change the content of the poem, but it does. And you're like sitting there like, oh, do I reformat the whole sentence or line? Or, you know, do I like focus on the content or the word, you know? And so like, that's one of the things where I think you're talking about, where like having to go through and find out, right? What are those things most important and how are they operating within a poem, so. Oh yeah, I, oh, and the article totally matters. And the comma, I mean, so an example that is definitely aged out of use for the most place, for the most part. Um, I used to, to introduce to students that Crowded House song, um, Don't Dream It's Over, and I say, okay, well, if you looked up the lyrics and you see them punctuated differently, it 100% changes the meaning, right? Like, don't dream it's over. If that's one, if that's one sentence, that's, that's incredibly hopeful, right? But don't dream, period, it's over. That's a totally different meaning. That period makes all the difference. <laughs> Oh yeah, oh yeah. It's a it's a it's a fun and tough world in the in the realm of poetry. Um, but yes, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, as we said, uh, was body came out in June of 2020. You should go pick that up. Uh, thank you, Billy, for spending some time with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Matthew. This was a blast. <laughs> all right.